All right, we are in a series called The Radical Call of Following Jesus. And uh, it is definitely true, and I think we are all aware of it. The call to follow Jesus, living as a follower of Christ, is a radical pursuit with a radical cost. Kyle Eidelman says it this way, following Jesus will cost you something. Following Jesus always costs you something. Oh, in this uh, society, it's so easy uh, with sound bites and memes and just uh, social media um, the images that pop up. That so much of the time, we can go through days, weeks even, uh, being supported by the encouraging parts of the gospel, which is good. Never bad. But the challenging parts of the, the gospel that go against what our heart and our flesh would like to do, that can sometimes be swept under the rug. And so today we are uh, looking at a passage where Jesus is pretty intense. And uh, we need to be able to recognize in that the intensity of Christ can lead to our encouragement and our growth and definitely leads to good and to the glory of God. So the passage we're looking at, uh, let's turn to it, Luke chapter 9. Uh, hopefully you have a Bible, can look off something, or if you don't, there's a Bible hopefully in the, the chair in front of you. And if you turn with me in that one, it's page 1039 in the, the Bible under the pew. This is Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 62. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Let's pray that God will open our eyes to understand what he would have us understand from this passage. Lord, we thank you for your word, and uh, this is a, like I said, an intense passage. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand and to be able to not just understand, but to apply it, have the courage and the strength to put into practice what we see, what we read, and what we understand from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. First thoughts on this passage, uh, when I looked at this, uh, after Chris and I had split up the, the passages, um, first thought was Jesus is intense, right? So sometimes, reading through the Gospels, I'm reminded, oh yeah, <laughs> He, uh, he says some pretty intense things. Uh, and that can go against what our culture thinks or hopes or wants to be true about Jesus. Uh, they would say, man, isn't Jesus usually meek, gentle, and humble? Yes and no. Uh, when you see just a passage or two or a verse or two thrown up on, in, on social media, usually, like I said, that's the easy, nice things to take. You know, the, the inclusivity and, and love, unending love and that kind of stuff. And those things, again, are true. But a full reading of Jesus' life reveals a Jesus that was radically on mission. He came for a purpose and he was set on that. He was focused not on placating the crowds or boosting self-esteem, Though the truths of God that he emphasized are worth rejoicing in daily. Rather, Jesus was dedicated to fulfilling God's work of redemption. God's calling in his life was of primary importance for Jesus and the sometimes offended people. Think of the Pharisees, who he had some pretty harsh words for. The people focused on earthly things. Uh, in uh, the book of Luke, someone says, Jesus, have, tell my brother to split the inheritance with me. And he says, who made me an arbiter between you and me? Like, that's not why I came. And even his earthly family, 
His family was one time sitting outside wanting to talk to him, his mother and brothers. And uh, someone said, hey, your family's outside. And he, sa he said, the people who do my father's will are, are my family. And apparently, he, uh, well, he didn't give them priority, at least. It doesn't seem like. But Jesus' dedication to the Father's will, above everything else, we have to remember, actually resulted in the greatest act of love in human history. So I'm talking about the crucifixion and the resurrection, him pay, laying down his life for us. And I describe it as an act of love because a lot of times when people come to this passage and they see the intensity and how Jesus seems to rebuff those following him, that's the first thing they, they point to, is like, that doesn't sound very loving of Jesus, right? I believe in a Jesus that's love. And uh, Luke has some pretty strong statements from Jesus that, uh, that counter that, um, if you don't look deeply, if you don't look at the whole picture. So, why is he so intense in this passage? Uh, let the dead bury their own dead. Uh, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of the kingdom of God. Those statements. Why is he intense? Well, uh, verse 51, look at that, says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven. His taking up. Jesus knew that the crucifixion and the resurrection, and the taking up to heaven, as talking about, uh, is soon to come. So why all of a sudden does he, has he been, uh, has set his face to Jerusalem? Well, a few verses before, um, turn with me if you want, to verses 28 through 36, specifically 29 through 31. This is the story of the transfiguration in the book of Luke. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. Here's the key. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Now, the transfiguration is in the other books as well, but it doesn't talk about the content of what Moses and Elijah were, were telling him, talking about it. But they were telling him, what you're going to do, you're, what you've been working towards, is about to happen. So, in verse 51, Jesus, because it was the time for him to be taken up, sets his face to Jerusalem. But this did not change his message it could be easy to look at this past these, uh, it's actually like 10 chapters, this section, and say, oh, since he's going to his crucifixion, all of a sudden Jesus is more harsh with people. That's, that's not quite true. A full reading of the gospel would show you that. But instead, Jesus was perhaps reminded and pointing out to people our core truth. Whatever you hold back from God will hold you back from serving him. And I think that's the thrust of these passage, this passage here today. So let's look at how that truth develops. First off, a little bit of context. Jesus' path to Jerusalem. At this time, when he, uh, as the, uh, the transfiguration and stuff, it seems from the narrative of Luke that he's in the area of Bethsaida, because that's their most recent city that it talks about a few verses before. And so here, Bethsaida is up there at the top right of your map. My dad was a pastor, and he, he loved maps, and so I realized I'm becoming just like my dad. Um, <laughs> he was up there, sets his face to Jerusalem, and he walks around 80 miles or so. It's hard to decipher from Google Maps at times, but about 80 miles, depending on the path he took. He's walking towards Jerusalem, and this actually, in the narrative of Luke, that's chapters 9 through 19. Every couple chapters, it talks about because he was going to Jerusalem, da-da-da-da-da, as he was going to Jerusalem, da-da-da-da-da. So this huge chunk, Luke, chapter, uh, the Gospel of Luke is 24 chapters, and this is the big chunk of Jesus' ministry that Luke reports on. Uh, and a lot of his teachings, a lot of his miracles, a lot of things, uh, famous parts of Jesus' ministry happen in this chunk as he's going to Jerusalem for the crucifixion. Uh, in these chapters, uh, a lot of, again, intense teaching points. Uh, he talks about uh, the Good Samaritan in chapter 10. Uh, that's important because of the first interaction he has with the Samaritans there. We'll get to that. Uh, the rich fool, where God says, this very night your soul is required of you. Um, the parable of the great banquet, where the uh, the person, uh, the, the master sent out and, and said, hey, I'm, I'm finally having my wedding feast. Come and join it with me. And they said, oh, I've got a field to go look at or I've got something else. They make excuses and so they don't, they can't, they don't come and they get uninvited and forced out actually. Chapter 14, again in Luke, uh, Jesus talks about 
his, whoever is disciple of him must hate his own father and mother. Again, intense language. Uh, the rich man in Lazarus, chapter 16, uh, chapter 18, the rich young ruler who wanted to be involved in the kingdom of God and follow Jesus, and Jesus said, sell all your possessions and follow me, and he wa walked away sad. So Jesus is confronting people through these 10 chapters. I'm going to cr be crucified. You don't know it. <laughs> but he's pointing out where people have their idols, where the people have their priorities uh, throughout. So keep that in mind as we go through this passage a bit. Okay, 51 through 62, we finally get to our passage. Five interactions. First one is Samaritans. Samaria, uh, that map, Samaria was between Bethsaida and Jerusalem, so the quickest way there would have been through Samaria, and that was somewhat common to go through uh, Samaria if you were a Jew in the northern parts. Samaritans, uh, 51 through 53, uh, 52, starting there. He sent messengers on ahead, went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him, but the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. Samaritans, Jews, hate each other. Now, I, growing up, I heard the story of the Good Samaritan, and so I always thought of it as, hey, Samaritans are kind of good, good guys, and Jews just hate them, right? And that, that wasn't the case. Hatred, both ways, really disliked each other. In fact, Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, talks about it was common for the Samaritans to hinder the Jews and kind of uh, ill-treat them on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover. Because the point of worship, the place of worship for a Jew was in Jerusalem at the temple for a Samaritan, because there was, uh, you have to go back to Chronicles and Kings and read about it, because there was a divide between the kingdoms at that point, there was a second place of worship set up uh, for the northern kingdom, and they still kind of held to that. So where they worship, was a big dividing point, Samaritans and Jews. Uh, you see that in John, uh, where the woman at the well, she realizes Jesus is a rabbi. That's what she talks about. Where do we worship? Um, in fact, Josephus, the uh, historian, even says that uh, Jews sometimes were murdered on their way to Jerusalem to worship by Samaritans, who just that hatred was that strong. The Samaritans, though, because Jesus, verse 53, was heading for Jerusalem, they would not receive him. They would not host him. They would not give him a place to rest for the night. So he had to go to another village. And here is the first thing that uh, people prioritize over Jesus, over the salvation that he brings. Identity. We live in a culture today where identity is key, right? People idolize identity all over the place now. Um, Personal autonomy, power to define myself and decide what is right for me, that's the highest truth. Don't step on that, or I'm going to lash out. We see that all over the place. So, first idol, Samaritans, kept them from accepting Jesus. Moving on to his second interaction, kind of, was the disciples. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Now, Jesus had not done anything like this, <laughs> like that, in any of his ministry. Uh, but I guess I give them a little bit of credit because they just saw him. They were on the mountain with him with the transfiguration. So they saw, this is the God-man. This is Son of God, really, in the truest sense. Um, so maybe a little bit of righteous indignation, maybe a newfound respect for Jesus. I don't know. But... Jesus makes it clear that's not what he's about. 55, Jesus turned and rebuked them. Uh, James and John were called the sons of thunder. And so, this, uh, that was a, that was in uh, the Gospel of Mark. It's told that that's what their nickname is. Uh, which is kind of crazy. It sounds like a TV series to me. So, sons of thunder <laughs> coming to HBO. <laughs> and you know what? I... Uh, if you don't know, if you may not believe me, but I used to be somewhat of a brawler <laughs> back in kindergarten. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, you can see it, right? Yeah. What? He's a pastor's kid? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I, apparently, I would get home from school and I would tell my brother about all the fights I had. <laughs> I don't know. I might have just been making some of them up, but I remember specifically sitting on uh, the jungle gym, that big globe thing with all the wires that kids would fall off and get hurt. You know, I was sitting on it after one of my fights with my wingman Brian Garrett, and uh, the recess aide had just told us that if she caught us fighting again, we'd get a referral. 
new word to me. So I asked Brian, what's a referral? And he said, that's when you don't get your chocolate milk. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> that was a reformed man. Man, yeah, no more fighting for me. In fact, the thought of somebody swinging at me, my whole dental history flashes before my eyes. So, sorry. All right, moving on. The, the disciples, I think they suffer from the same idol. Pride, identity. Uh, maybe it's a little more complex than that, but you get the sense of, hey, they, they're not respecting us. They don't deserve to live, right? So they're resisting us. Kill them. The disciples did not understand Jesus' message, which is really unfortunate for Jesus. He's been with these guys like three years. He's going to his crucifixion, and the guys that he's going to hand the kingdom to <laughs> just don't seem to get it at all. Oh, if I were in Jesus' place, I would be frustrated. All right, same idol, first idol. Identity, pride, something along those lines. Okay, let's move on. Third interaction, the first volunteer, verses 57 to 58. Somebody along the road, apparently volunteers. I will follow you wherever you go. This man didn't know where Jesus was going. Many people expected Jesus to inaugurate the kingdom of God by overthrowing the Romans. So maybe he thought that. Maybe he just wanted to learn. Maybe he just wanted to be a disciple and help out with the ministry. But Jesus knows that following him is hard. And this man apparently is not willing to give up his comfort to follow Jesus. Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. That was underscored just previously with his interaction with the Samaritans, right? People throw him out. People reject him. But more than that, he's going to Jerusalem. He will be flogged. He will be tortured. He will be hung on a cross and killed. And apparently, don't know for sure, uh, this uh, first volunteer doesn't follow him. Uh, we have the idol of comfort a lot in our culture today. We live in a society that idolizes comfort. Average American household spends $200 a month on entertainment and $200 a month eating out. And that's on an average household income of $50,000. So that's, that adds up to 10% of the budget of a household is on entertainment and eating out. Yeah, combine that with the fact that 76% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Like, there's, a, there's an epidemic of focus on entertainment, and we can't afford it. I like what William Barclay says. The Christian must realize that he is given life not to keep it for himself, but to spend it for others. Not to husband its flame, but to burn himself out for Christ and for men. Too convicting for me. Let's move on. Two, the cold one. <laughs> Verses 59 to 60. He said to another man, follow me. Jesus called him. You follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Harsh. Let me bury my father. Now scholars point out that this man's father is likely not already dead. If he had already died, he wouldn't be out seeing Jesus following him, saying, hey, I want to follow you. He'd be burying his father. So likely the man's father was near death, close to death. Some people even say, hey, maybe there was an inheritance that he needed to secure when his father died. It's hard to tell exactly. Um, but we do know Jesus is going to Jerusalem to be crucified. And if the man waits around to bury his father, it may be years before his father actually dies. Jesus is going to be crucified, risen already. The time to follow Jesus was then, was now. His call on Jesus. This is a specific call from Jesus. You follow me. Does, Jesus, does God know our situations when he calls us? He does. He does. So, it is hard to pinpoint the exact issue that held this man back. Um, could be social expectations. The son buries father. Could be the inheritance, maybe. There's not really any textual support. I don't know. Uh, family responsibilities, maybe just out of love for his father. It's hard to say. Um, but for this one, I, I felt like the, the idol of society kind of covered that kind of stuff. Social expectations, 
maybe opportunities, school, uh, do those things hold you back? This is a lot, this controls a lot of people's behavior. And uh, there's a lot of decisions based on, well, I need to secure my place in society or I need to live up to the expectations of me, uh, peer pressure, that kind of stuff. Uh, I think that idol is very active in our, our culture today. And we probably make a lot of decisions based on those thoughts without really thinking about it. Uh, now, if you think, no, I think his idol was family or his, his emphasis was a family, don't worry, got you covered. Uh, the second volunteer, verses 61 to 62. Lost my scripture. Oh, it's right on top. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus was walking to Jerusalem. Who knows where this man's family was? It might have been a journey. He might have had to go all the way back up to Galilee or something to say goodbye and then come. It might again be that there's no time to follow me. The time to follow is mint knees now. Or I'm going to be crucified here in a couple days, a few days. Um, so there's no time. But I think Jesus knew his heart like he knew the hearts of all men. You really... Your, more, your priority is your family. Follow them. Don't say you're going to follow me if really you're going to look back and always regret and always uh, want to go back to your family. Now, it's not an unrealistic, it's not a, a crazy request. Elijah did this, Elisha did the same thing when Elijah called him to service. But I think knowing the context of Jesus' path, he's going to Jerusalem. He's going to be crucified any day. Uh, I think that puts that into perspective. We don't have time. They didn't have time. And we, waiting for Christ to return, don't have time to prioritize other things. Uh, so, I felt this guy's second volunteer, his idol was relationships. We have to ask ourselves, would it be too much for us? If God called us away from our family? If that was actually, if we understood that is what God's doing. He's calling me to go to this country. He's calling me to go here. He's calling me to move away. Or there, my kids are moving away, but God has called me here. Is that going to be too much for God to ask of you? Now, we got to be clear. God wants us to take care of our family. Okay, 1 Timothy 5.8, Paul says, Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith, is worse than an unbeliever. So in one instance, we realize Jesus is using extreme language to make a point. In another instance, we need to remember, God gave us a family, he intends us to take care of them. This is, uh, that's true for all of us. But there may be times when God does call us away. We just have to ask ourselves, are we, truly, are we truly loving God first when we tr try to prioritize our, our family? If we ever put someone else, even our own family, above God, are we truly loving them? I would argue not. To illustrate that, I have a poem written by John Piper for his son's wedding. I'd like to read it to you. I think it says it very well. The God whom we have loved and in whom we have lived and who has been, our rock these 22 good years, with you now bids us with sweet tears to let you go. A man shall cleave his father and his mother leave, a man shall leave his father and his mother cleave, henceforth unto his wife and be one unashamed flesh and free. This is the word of God today, and we are happy to obey, for God has given you a bride who answers every prayer we've cried. For over 20 years our claim for you before we knew her name. And now you ask that I should write a poem, a risky thing, in light of what you know, that I am more the preacher than the poet or the artist. I am honored by your bravery, and I comply. I do not grudge these sweet confines of rhyming pairs and metered lines. They are old friends. They like it when I bid them help me once again, to gather feelings into form and keep them durable and warm. And so we met in recent days and made the flood of love and praise and counsel from a father's heart to flow within the banks of art. Here is a portion of the stream, my son, a sermon poem, its theme, a double rule of love that shocks, a doctrine in a paradox. If you now aim your wife to bless, then love her more and love her less. 
If in the coming years by some strange providence of God you come to have the riches of this age and painless stride across the stage, beside your wife be sure in health to love her, love her more than wealth. And if your life is woven in a hundred friendships and you spin a festal fabric out of all, your sweet affections, great and small, be sure no matter how it rends to love her, love her more than friends. And if there comes a point when you are tired and pity whispers, do yourself a favor, come be free, embrace the comforts here with me. Know this, your wife surpasses these. So love her, love her more than ease. And when your marriage bed is pure and there is not the slightest lure of lust for any but your wife and all is ecstasy in life, a secret all of this protects, go love her, love her more than sex. And if your taste becomes refined and you are moved by what the mind of man can make and dazzled by his craft, remember that the why of all his work is in the heart. So love her, love her more than art. And if your own should someday be the craft that all critics agree is worthy of a great esteem, and sales exceed your wildest dream, beware the dangers of a name, and love her, love her more than fame. And if to your surprise, not mine, God calls you by some strange design to risk your life for some great cause, let neither fear nor love give pause. And when you face the gate of death, then love her, love her more than breath. Yes, love her, love her more than life. Oh, love the woman called your wife. Go love her as your earthly best. Beyond this venture not, but lest your love become a fool's facade, be sure to love her less than God. It is not wise or kind to call an idol by sweet names and fall, as in humility before a likeness of your God adore. Above your best, beloved on earth, the God alone who gives her worth. And she will know in second place that your great love is also grace. And that your high affections now are flowing freely from a vow beneath these promises first made to you by God. Nor will they fade, for being rooted by the stream of heaven's joy which you esteem and cherish more than breath and life, that you may give it to your wife. The greatest gift you give your wife is loving God above her life. And thus I bid you now to bless. Go love her more by loving less. Piper's emphasizing, we never really do anybody a favor by loving them more than God. In fact, whatever we hold back from Jesus, even if it's your spouse, that most important relationship, whoever that is in your life, whatever we hold back from Jesus will hold us back from serving him. Uh, you might feel that giving him the majority of your life is enough. If not merely majority, then 80% should do it, right? Surely 90% is enough. Maybe you think you'd be crazy to ask for 100% of your life. Perhaps you wouldn't admit it verbally, but I'm guessing there's a little bit of all of us that feels robbed, wronged, if we can't have an ownership of our life, even a part of it, right? The cost of following Jesus is indeed radical. But we need to always remember this. The cost of not following Jesus is always greater than the cost of following Jesus. Whatever we take for ourselves, we will lose. Whatever we give to God, we will reap a reward for. He will repay us. Jim Elliot, uh, a missionary who... Uh, lost his life witnessing to the people, uh, the natives that he was trying to save. Um, he wrote, He is no fool who trades what he cannot keep for that which he cannot lose. So, let's try to illustrate this with a crude graphic. Okay, the four idols that we talked about from the five interactions Jesus had. Identity, comfort, society, relationships. You know, that includes... I'm just trying to think through it. Yeah. These are the ones from our context, but that covers most of our life. Most people, when trying to follow Jesus, they just shove him in on the side. So, go to the next slide here. They had Jesus over there, and then they say, oh yeah, see, I love Jesus Christ. I love my relationship, society, comfort, identity. I have everything. That's my life, right? But Jesus rejects this model. That's what we just saw in this passage, right? If you have anything else that's competing with me, you're not a true disciple of mine. Living as a follower of Christ 
is a radical pursuit with a radical cost. This is why Jesus says later in this narrative in Luke, chapter 14, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began and wasn't able to finish. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Now we know that hate is antithetical to Jesus' teachings. So what did he mean? Jesus is using extreme language to make a strong point. The point is, nothing can compete with God. Nothing can displace God from being the most valuable thing in our life. So let me show you how those pillars of your life should really be arranged. There we go. Jesus Christ is the foundation through which we find our identity, through which we take our comfort, through which we hope to have any societal impact, and through which we can really have pure and loving relationships. See, if I think, oh, well, I'm going to love Christ and I'm going to love my wife, and those are separate things, I'm never going to love my wife well. I'm going to love my wife in a flawed and even sinful way. But if I think, okay, in Christ, I'm going to love my wife the way that Christ would have me love her, seeking to glorify him through how I love her, I'm going to love her in a greater way. So it's still not going to be perfect, but there's going to be a God-honoring, it's going to be Christ-centered. And that will honor God. Christ is first how I love my wife, but also Christ is the pursuit. I love my Christ so I can love Christ more. That's why Paul says in Philippians, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That's what he means. Christ is the foundation, not one of several pursuits. The foundation of all my pursuits. So hopefully that makes it a little more clear. Let's repeat our core truth. Whatever we hold back from Jesus will hold us back from serving him. Let's pray. Lord, you have hard truths for us. And sometimes it can be hard to understand, and sometimes I think the enemy potentially makes it hard to understand. It reminds us of why we don't want to believe what you tell us. And yes, uh, Jesus was on a hard mission in a difficult time and said these hard things, but it was not harshness without love. This is a true deep love that knows that our deepest need and his truth is what would really set us free and draw us into a real relationship with you. Help us, Lord, to have Christ as the foundation of all of our relationships, of all that we pursue, whether it's our comfort to give our body and our minds the respite it needs, to heal so that we can serve you better, whether it's through how we intend to interact with and have an impact on the society, whether it's our identity, Lord, help us to have our identity sourced and grounded in what Jesus has done for us and who you have called us to be. And Lord, in our relationships, help us, Lord, not to idolize those that we love, but hold them in their proper place with you as supreme and our love for them a sign and a one outworking of how we love you and how we are seeking you. I believe, Lord, that if we do this well as a church, those that look at our lives, those that see us, those that inter interact with us will know, will see, will sense something is different and that your power and your truth and your love truly abides here. So help us, Lord, in this to recognize our own affections and to surrender them to you so that we might serve you fully. In Jesus' name, amen.